going to give a lecture on the theological anthropology of the Pentateuch. That's a little too much of a definitive article. I don't think this is the theological anthropology of the Pentateuch um, because I'd have to do more work to do that. This is something more like um, uh, some organized uh, thoughts and musings and hypotheses about humanity as seen in the Pentateuch, something like that. And, and one thing to say too, so I'm a theologian, um, but I'm a sort of theologian with the weird training. I never took Greek and Hebrew. I never got an MDiv. I came in through the humanities in the back door and ended up doing systematic theology. I love it, but I'm in, in a funny place where I don't have the kind of biblical studies training that most theologians have. Um, so I, I'm sitting here much more like an advanced version of you all than like an expert in biblical studies. Um, and so I'm kind of aware of that, of that as I'm talking about this stuff. I'm a little wary of not wanting to lead you astray. Uh, but I also want you to know that because I'm just having a blast learning from the Pentateuch in the last couple of weeks as I've been teaching a whole bunch of sessions, but as I've been praying for the lecture. And year after year, as I do more, more work as a theologian to be grounded in the scriptures, I, I'm just like, this is a fascinating big book. There's so much in here, the drama of it the insight in it, the complexity of it, um, it just kind of blows my mind. And so I'm a systematic theologian. Right now I just want to read a bunch of Old Testament books. Um, I'm really having fun with it. So um, it's the commend it to you, the Great Books Project works. So just reading, you know, in English translation together and, and trying to take the text seriously can yield tons of insight. Um, so, um, there we go. I want to start, so I think the first half or so of the lecture tonight, I just, I want to offer a close reading of Genesis 1 to 3. Um, the Pentateuch is five books. Genesis 1 to 3 is three little chapters of the five books. Often, um, so, so part of the backstory here is I'm just beginning work on a big book on theological anthropology, and part of, part of its remit is to be rooted in the scriptures. So that's part of why I'm, I'm trying to do lectures like this. Um, too often, actually, people talk about it, theological anthropology as if everything's done in Genesis 1 through 3. Um, that can be a real problem because there's, the biblical witness is, is broad and deep and it's very, um, it's very nuanced. And so he, there's a danger that in paying attention to 1 through 3, um, we give disproportionate attention to it. That said, um, there's a lot there. There's a lot there about what it means to be human, um, particularly if we sort of keep in mind this distinction between the created state and the fallen state. Um, we have to be really careful as we navigate that terrain, um, as we try to figure out what is sort of held over from the state of creation before the fall and, and what, what changes or is even lost or distorted in that process. Um, but anyways, I wanna give a close reading. And I'm gonna start by actually reading it to you. So um, most of you are in here when I say get out your Bibles. If you weren't, get out your Bibles. Um, you can get out your phone. Please don't text a bunch. Um, but I'm going to read to you uh, a few different passages as we go and then just stop and talk about some stuff. So first, Genesis 1, 26 through 30. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You have them for food. And every beast of the earth and every bird of the heaven and everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So just a few, a few thoughts. Keep, keep this open because I really, I mean, this is how, I, how I'm preparing this lecture. This is a good way to learn is I had my Bible open and I started typing some notes and asking some questions and, and trying to think through some of the issues here. So, so first is what, what is the image and likeness of God? Huge question. Talk about something that has been given probably disproportionate attention in conversations on theological anthropology. Um, book after book after book after book, talking about what the image of, of God is, what people have said it is. Um, so spoiler alert, I'm going to basically tell you that we're not quite sure. 
um, and that we need to be careful that we don't say too much. Um, uh, the image, uh, first of all, I, I think image, there's tons of debate on this point, but I think from a, just a plain sense reading of the text that image and likeness are likely the same thing. You probably got some kind of parallelism going on here. Um, and then I don't think there's a significant material distinction. Sometimes people will say there's a very material distinction. An image is sort of like the baseline of what it means. And, and likeness is something more like the, the aspirational piece that can fluctuate. Um, I don't think that's, that's probably the case, partly because uh, over in chapter five, where there's a parallel. Um, it talks about uh, our being in the likeness of God. It doesn't use image language. So the text just doesn't seem overly fastidious about distinguishing between the two. Um, so that's that briefly. Now on the image itself, I think we need to be really careful uh, about confining the image to a particular capacity of humanity in such a way to exalt some and den denigrate others. So that's, that's been done over and over and over in the history of Christian thought. And usually, the image has been tied into what is seen to be the superior part of humanity in that era. Um, so in the ancient era when to be human was mostly to be a rational animal, of course, what's, what's the image of God? It's, it's our reason. Um, in an era like the early, early 19th century uh, of Romanticism, What's the image of God? It's, it's probably something like our emotions or our expressivism. Uh, the 20th century, um, which has had a fascination with humans as linguistic animals or as relational animals, that they kind of were uniquely linguistic or relational, the image of God has been located in our relationality, our uh, capacity for language. Now, the danger there, twofold. One is it treats only part of us as being the image of God, and the text just doesn't give us reason to think that part of us is the image. It just says we are made in God's image. We, it's just the whole of who we are. So it's a comprehensive thing. The, the second danger is that you, you sort of subtly imply that people who have like more, um, uh, more developed capacities in those areas are maybe like a little more in the image of God. And usually people wouldn't quite say that. Sometimes it's, it's explicit. More often it's kind of hinted at. Um, so if to be, you know, if, if God's relational and we are in his image insofar that we're relational, I mean, this isn't very, this wouldn't be said academically, but kind of downstream, it would be something like, what if I'm an introvert who likes being alone? You know, it's, it's almost like, look, I mean, God's tri triune and humans are relational and that's what it means to be in God's image. And so I should be really extroverted and social. Again, that's sloppy thinking, but I think that's part of how the images function. I think we have to be really nervous about over, um, over nailing it down. Also, if you have human beings who, are, who lack capacities, and, and this is where uh, uh, rationality and language are, are most problematic. Um, if you have one of my godchildren is nonverbal. Um, God help us if we say that because of that, Matthias is not made in the image of God. That is a wicked, wicked thing. But you could see how you could get that, you get there in a really innocuous way. Just say, hey, you know, to be rational is to be in the image of God, or to be linguistic is to be in the image of God. Um, but if you don't have a nonverbal person in your life, you don't realize the consequences. And my hope is that none of us wants to say that there is a human being who is not made in the image of God. In fact, that's probably the most important thing about the image is we should say that all of us are made in the image of God. Um, Luther, so I've been reading... Um, uh, Ephraim the Syrian, who's a 4th century Syrian theologian, his commentary in Genesis, and also Luther's commentary in Genesis, um, as I've been preparing the lecture. L Luther has this, this wonderful apophatic reserve um, in light of how far we've fallen. So he said, because we've fallen, there's very little we can know. This is Luther. He says, therefore, when we, when we speak about that image, we're speaking about something unknown. Not only have we had no experience of it, but we continually experience the opposite. So as a result, he expresses this dissatisfaction with the typical speculative determinations of the image found, particularly in the wake of Augustine. In Augustine's book on the Trinity, he does a lot of work with that. And Luther writes, I'm afraid that since the loss of this image, and Luther thinks we've lost the image of God since the fall. He says, I'm afraid that since the loss of this image through sin, we cannot understand it to any extent. Memory, will, and mind, these are Augustinian categories. Memory, will, and mind, we have indeed. 
But they're most depraved and most seriously weakened. Yes, to put it more clearly, they're utterly leprous and unclean. If these powers are the image of God, it will also follow that Satan was created according to the image of God. Since he surely has these natural endowments, such as memory and a very superior intellect and a most determined will to, or, to a fi, far higher degree than we have. it. So I love Luther's reserve. He says again and again in his Genesis commentary, you know what happened in the fall? We, we just lost it all. And not just the image, but we lost dominion. Um, we don't really know what paradise is like. We don't know what it was like to have dominion. I mean, this is gone. Um, and because of that, there's very little we can say specific about it. Now, here's what we do know. We know that God, this is 127, that God created the first Adam in the image of God such that to say man is to say male and female. To say man is to say male and female. That's just 127. And so Eve from the Syrian says, Adam, I love this, Adam was both one and two. He was one, that he was Adam, and he was two because he had been created male and female. So both men and women, and all men and women are created in the image of God. And that's what later in Genesis 9 uh, underwrites the prohibition of killing anyone. It's because we're made in the image of God that we can't kill someone. Um, now we also know um, from, from, a, from a sort of just surface read of just the text of Genesis here, the close, I, think, I think probably the biggest thing we would say about the image of God is that, is that humanity is given dominion over the animals. Um, so perhaps this is the closest we can come to a, a reflection of God. The, the dominion that we share could be a certain kind of creaturely correspondence to his dominion as the Lord over heaven and earth. And so Ephraim again says, it's the dominion that Adam received over the earth and over all that is in it that constitutes the likeness of God who has dominion over the heavenly things and the earthly things. Ephraim's explicit. He says, there you go. It's dominion. Luther um, does a really nice job talking about how dominion implies knowledge and entails obedience. He writes, who can conceive of that part as it were of the divine nature that Adam and Eve had insight into all the dispositions of all animals, into their characters and all their powers. So notice what he's saying. He's saying dominion requires insight, it requires wisdom. I've got to know a thing and know it intimately to properly be able to be a Lord over it. If, I, if it's the kind of Lord that gives life, and this, we know that our Lord is the kind of Lord that gives life, it's the kind of Lord that, that orders things to their own flourishing, then I have to know these things. And so he, Luther really, um, really wants to trumpet the knowledge that Adam and Eve had of the creation, a knowledge that's been unparalleled since the fall. Now he says, this is a quote, now we see the birds and the fish caught by cunning and deceit and by skill the beasts are tamed. But this is extremely small and far inferior to that first dominion. When there was no need of skill or cunning, when the creature simply obeyed the divine voice because Adam and Eve were commanded to have dominion over them. Isn't that, isn't that great? So, so you wouldn't have to, I mean, what we do is we set traps. We trick animals because they don't come when we call. They aren't our servants. There is often, they're, they're either independent of us entirely or they're our adversaries. And Luther's saying, no, no, dominion is the kind of the lordship in, in, a, in a life-giving way where you just, you just ask someone to come and they call. Now we have to set traps. That's how far we've lost our dominion. A couple of the quick things. Primordial vegetarianism. It's just worth noting. Adam and Eve were created as vegetarians. Um, they, they were not eating meat. They were given all all the plants they needed for food. And, and Luther again will say, oh my gosh, was it the best food? You guys have no idea. He'll say that over and over. Because I think about vegetarianism. <laughs> um, kale, great. Uh, Luther, says, Luther says, this is the best. This is the absolute best. In fact, he would probably say that the fact that to me a burger sounds infinitely better than a kale salad, and that, that's, that's a mark of the fall in, in my life. I mean, like he would, I think he would seriously say it. The other thing from that passage is the primordial blessing. Notice this. God blesses humanity before he curses humanity. The first word is a word of blessing. And it's tied to fruitfulness. Be fruitful and multiply. He blessed them. He said, be fruitful and multiply. By the way, that's not that um, special in the creation. 
The birds and the fish also, 122, are given uh, the invitation to be fruitful and multiply. Lots of ways. We could have a long conversation about the ways in which humanity is like the animals. And this is one of the ways. And that's not a denigrating comment. All right, get out your Bibles yet again. Chapter 2, starting in verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And go down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I'll make a helper. I'll make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So first, how? So this is in this kind of second, second rendition, is this a second creation story? Um, is this the stuff that God uh, or Moses uh, forgot about the first time I wanted to add. I don't know how to read this, but there seems to be two creation stories. And in this second one, we, we get an account of how God created man. So how did he create him? Well, 2-7. The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So a few things here. First, there's direct divine involvement in making, and, and not just the involvement of speech. I think this is the only time where God doesn't speak something into existence. Um, but he, he um, as Irenaeus would say, he gets his hands involved. He comes into contact. That's anthropomorphic, but it speaks of the direct uh, personal involvement. You can speak from afar, but if, you're gonna, if your hands are going to be involved, you have to be up close. Um, second is that man is made from dust here. Um, that's just, a, just further on, but it's, again, not, not by speaking. He's made from dust. Uh, and God breathes his own breath into the man of dust to be his life. So um, I don't think that means there's a divine part of us in sort of a strong sense. Um, I don't think yet we're in this strong sense of this is the Holy Spirit, or the, the, the word is in the background there. But at the very least, there's a sense of the intimate, um, ongoing involvement of God with humanity, but also the ongoing dependence, such that if God takes away his own breath, humanity ceases to live. We, we breathe by the very breath of God's life. Um, Luther says, this is, this is nice, he says, man was created by a unique counsel, let us. So it's the first time in the creation narrative when God says, let us do something. He seems to be sort of setting back and saying, I know what we're going to do. So he's got, there seems to be some sense of, if not premeditation, at least sort of announcing of a plan. So man is created by unique counsel and wisdom and shaped by the finger of God. And he says, this nevertheless proves conclusively that man is the most outstanding creature. When God creates him, he takes counsel and he employs a new procedure. So there are, are parts in the text that are announcing to us a new thing going on. And this verse, by the way, is particularly important to the wisdom literature. Um, the, the image of God language is picked up a lot in the New Testament, partly because Christ is the image of the invisible God and we're conformed to him. But in the Old Testament wisdom literature, it's much more 2-7, the sense of being of the dust from the ground and having the breath of life. These, these are constantly on display in the wisdom literature. Um, now, God made the woman from a rib he took from the man's side and then he brought her to him. And this is Ephraim uh, of Syria. 
This is wonderful. Ephraim says, Eve was inside Adam in the rib that was drawn out from him. Although she was not in his mind, she was in his body. And she was not only in his body with him, but she was also in soul and spirit with him. For God added nothing to that rib that he took out except the structure and the adornment. This is so it's beautiful, first of all. It's kind of poetic and you know, maybe even a little romantic. But there's a profound thing going on. So, so listen to this. God added nothing to that rib that he took out except the structure and the adornment. Why? Because she was also in soul and spirit within him. So there seems to be this sense that there was the, the Adam, this first human, was somehow the man and the woman in one. And when God took out this rib, it's sort of a duplication. Also a differentiation going on there. Um, but, but you couldn't say more about the way that there was a oneness of these two um, before they were differentiated. Uh, next, from this passage, where will he live? Where, where, where will the man live and what will he do? He's placed uh, into the garden. So, I mean, Luther, I was reading Luther today, he goes so far as to say that, therefore, it's clear that Adam was created outside the garden because he was placed into it. That might be a little much, but... I mean, there is some sense of being his, his placement. He's placed into the garden in Eden to work it and keep it, 2, 8, and 15. So God planted it. God's the, God's the is he the gardener? He's the initiating gardener, we could say. Uh, God planted it. The man keeps it. Um, so what is this? Is this, um, is this cultivation? Is it partnership? And it's definitely not initiation. Um, but, but it does seem to be some kind of, at the very least, he's taking care of the things that God made. He seems to be cultivating. I don't think there's any reason not to think that he was, wasn't even, I don't know, I don't, probably not bettering, but in some sense enhancing this already good and perfect creation. Um, Andy Crouch has a wonderful book called Culture Making. And he said, you know what culture is? Culture is what we make of the world. And he means that in two senses interpretively, what, what do you make of that thing? We're already engaging in culture when we interpret something in the world. But he also means like what we make of it. You know, like you get, you get metal and then you get a water bottle. You get wood and you get a lectern. We're making something of the world here. And I take it that part of what Adam and Eve would have done in cultivating the garden is that they would have made something of it. That it wasn't wild. It didn't need to be like, you know, pruned and, you know, gotten into a good order. God made this beautiful thing. But I take that part of, part of the partnership um, that he invites them into is to make something of this garden. But remember, all of this is pre-curse. This is pre-curse work. Um, Luther uh, believes that there were not even such things as thorns and thistles at this point. Because you go to the, the curse, where Adam's going to have to toil with thorns and thistles. He says, that's a curse thing. There weren't even thorns and thistles. Um, this is Luther directly. For to us, work is something burdensome, he says. But for Adam, it would have been a supreme joy, more welcome than any leisure. Um, so again, I think, I think we have to really discipline our imaginations when we think pre-fall because everything we know is, is tainted by, by the curse. So my voice is a little weak right now. I lost my voice for a month because I've got good work to do. Um, and I'm subject to the fall. I'm tired right now. I'm a little warm, a little comfortable. You, know, you guys all look. So all these little things that are part of the very good work I have to do, that, that compromise it, that make it work rather than play. Uh, and this is not the work that Adam and Eve would have known. So we have to remember that again and again. Um, it does seem to be that in some sense, at least, that God has a law in the garden as well. Um, he has a law and he has a test. So that's 2, 16, 17, when the Lord commanded the man. There's a commandment saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. There's a command there. Um, now, it's easy. I've been in these you know, Deuteronomy sessions and Exodus sessions. That is a lot of law. Um, in the garden, just don't eat this one thing. And it starts with eat anything you want, just not that one. But there is a law that does, seems to be God's way of ordering his people's existence even before the fall. The other thing is God does seem to have this 
this regular way of, of probative work with his people, probative as in testing. Um, this is what he does. He tests Adam and Eve. Eventually, he tests Jesus in the wilderness. In the wilderness, that's also a place where God's people get tested. Um, and this testing is often, um, often the, the thought is that you pass the test and you emerge into um, a new reality. So a lot of theologians think, you know what would have happened if Adam and Eve had simply obeyed the Lord? Is they would have merged into that state that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. They would have merged into these spiritual bodies that would have been immune um, to sin and death um, if they had passed this initial test. Um, also to notice here, man gave names to all the animals. Bonus points if you know who wrote that song. The Youth of America. Does it help if I say I hate his voice, but a lot of people think he's amazing? Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan had this kind of short Christian phase, and in it, he has a song. <laughs> Did you know this? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the Lord knows about his soul. I'm just saying, like, he had a short phase where he was writing, like, really explicitly Jesus' albums, and he has a song called Man Gave Names to All the Animals. It's kind of a lame song, but anyways. <laughs> But Adam gives names to all the animals. So here's the, here's the thing to think about. Um, when Adam named the animals, does he confer something on them or does he recognize something? Does he in some sense add to them in naming them? Or does he merely recognize what they are? I don't think that's an easily answered question. So and we're not going to take the time to do it. Um, but I do think it's a fascinating one, and it relates to what it means to have dominion. It relates to what it means to uh, participate in God's work of cultivation. Um, what it re relates to what, what making something of the world actually means. Um, I, do think, I do think it's likely that naming is an exercise of dominion here. Because part of what naming does is it, um, yeah, I want to say this carefully because Adam eventually names Eve, and I don't quite know what to do with that. But at least for the, the animals, I think in part what's going on here is um, Adam is exercising loving authority. It's his to name them. It's not them to name themselves. Um, and God has given it to Adam to name them. Um, also, there, if you look at this, you might wonder why this is here. Um, with passages like this, we're so familiar with them, it's easy to miss the fact that they could have been written otherwise. But it, it seems here, I think, and rather comically, that the animals are brought out as potential companions. You, you notice that? There wasn't a helper fit. And God made all the animals and brought them along and, to see what Adam would call them. Um, none of, they're, they're brought along as potential animals and, and helpers fit for the man, but they don't fit, of course. Um, but still notice that the, the same introductory language is used for the woman. Do you see this? The Lord God brought them, the animals, or brought her to the man. You notice this? Um, and, and when he named her, I think he, he recognized God's creation of her in that instance, rather than asserting something. So he might have been asserting something in the naming of the animals. Who knows what he called them? But with Eve, it's, she will be called woman because she was taken out of man. So he recognized God's prior action there. Also, quick thing. This is great. I love this. Take this to the bank. The helper language there. Women, how many of you want to be called the helper of your husband if you get married? Yeah, so if you, if you, learn, what it mean, if you learn what it means, you should, you should love this thing. Helper, uh, this word easer, I think... Every other instance, or almost every other instance at the very least of it in the Old Testament is referring to God. This is the one who saves your bacon, who delivers you. The Lord is my help. He is my salvation. The Lord of heaven and earth. So whatever's going on with gender here, and I think it's a very, very complex text, we know that to have a helper is not to have like a little buddy who rides in your sidecar. It has, it's to have someone who will save you will help you out of a jam. I, just, I love that. I think, I think that's one of the, the most liberating words. Um, so Psalm 115, 11, you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. 
The other thing in this passage, this has the highest possible theology of marriage, sexuality, and the body. It doesn't get any higher. Marriage is grounded in creation. It's not an arbitrary contract that someday people think up because it's pragmatic. It's grounded in creation. And it's a returning to the one flesh from which these two were made. Uh, there is even a sense, I mean, I, I hate the whole kind of complete me stuff. Um, you should too, for lots of good reasons. <laughs> there is a sense in which um, there is a completion here, uh, which doesn't mean that everyone needs to get married, but, but there's a sense in which there's a return from the one, to the one from which one has been cloven that even feels a little like Aristophanes in the symposium. It's also different in a, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. It's also different in a thousand words. Um, the other thing, the other thing, the highest possible theology of marriage, sexuality, and the body, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. None of you have been there. There you go. This is a time where you could be naked and not ashamed, and even naked with someone else and not ashamed. Highest possible. Okay, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree <laughs> and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns, thistles, it shall bring forth for you. So Luther was actually onto something there. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it, you were taken for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Tons of stuff. I'm going to just cherry pick a few things. Uh, but one thing I find pretty instructive, this is a, it's a debate. I don't know that they knew what was going on, but it, it, it shows up as a debate. And it's a question of whether Adam and Eve were easy targets. Um, most theologians, I mean, there's this like funny little scholastic debate. When did they sin? And it, it's usually like, that day or five minutes later or maybe the next day or maybe they had a whole week to like, you know, be sinless. Um, but it's always really, really quick. Luther says it's the next day because the next day was the Sabbath and the Sabbath is the day we're supposed to worship the Lord and listen to the word of God. 
Um, and clearly they didn't listen to the word of God. All this stuff wouldn't have happened. So it must have been the next day. But it happened soon. But, but here's the, the question is, what, sh- what should we have expected of these brand new created beings? Yes, they were without sin. But they were also capable of sin. They did sin. I mean, were we, are we talking about people who were like super, super righteous, but had like this much of a chance to sin? Are we talking about like blank slates? Who knows where they're going to go? So here are Irenaeus and again, Ephraim the Syrian, uh, the fourth century Syrian theologian. So here's Irenaeus, second century. Irenaeus uh, argued that Adam and Eve were created good, but not yet perfect, and that they were young and immature. So he says in Against Heresies, he says, in paradise, they were both naked and were not ashamed, inasmuch as they, having been created a short time previously, had no understanding of the the procreation of children, for it was necessary that they should first come to adult age and then multiply from that time onward. So they're not of adult age yet. Now, I don't know if that means they're three or they're 17 or whatever adult age is. In fact, it probably would have been younger for Irenaeus. But he says that. And then in the demonstration, the, the book you guys read, the apostolic preaching, he says, but they, however, were, were in their full development. He's talking about the animals over which um, humans had dominion. He says, they were in their full development. while the Lord, that is the man, was very little since he was an infant. And it was necessary for him to reach full development by growing in this way. But the man was a young child, not yet having a perfect deliberation. And because of this, he was easily deceived by the seducer. And he goes on to say things like Cain's sin, way worse than Adam and Eve's sin. He was easily deceived. Now here's Ephraim. Um, Here's my summary of Ephraim. Hardly. So Ephraim says they were, quote, young adults. The law that was set for them testifies to their full maturity and their transgression of the commandment should bear witness to their arrogance. He says, look, there's a commandment. They knew what it meant and they failed to adhere to it. So sin on Ephraim's read is profoundly unnecessary and, and even unlikely. It seems the serpent, this is crazy. It seems not only was the serpent like, that he, he, he didn't just see in Adam and Eve an easy target, but he was no match for Adam, according to Ephraim. The serpent, he says, who didn't have the mind of man, didn't possess the wisdom of mankind. Adam was also greater than the serpent by the way he was formed, by his soul, by his mind, by his glory, and by his place. Therefore, it's, it's evident that in cunning also, Adam was infinitely greater than the serpent. He continues, Adam, who was set up as ruler and governor over all animals, was wiser than all the animals. He who set down names to them uh, is more clever than any of them. And Ephraim goes out of his way to lay the blame, not at the feet of the serpent's cunning, but at the feet of, quote, the avarice that came from within herself, that is from Eve. So he sees the serpent as like a mere occasion for what these grown man, this grown man and woman should have never done. They were smarter, they were shrewder, they knew better, they had all the capacities they needed, um, and they did it anyways. So I hope you can feel there something about, now, the Bible doesn't tell us how old they were. It doesn't tell us much other than they were good and that sin was not a thing um, and that they were deceived. And part of the deception was, was a sort of redescribing of God's words to them. And there was something about the appetites. It was good, good for food. It was a delight to the eye. That's all we know. But I hope you can feel the sense of like the, how a few early decisions have major consequences for how we think of that, that first sin. Um, oh, I've got so much I want to say to you. Okay, I'm going to just, just a couple more things to pick, pick up from Genesis 3. Um, one is the hiding and the shame that is there and heartbreaking. So the first change after eating the fruit, then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Uh, oh my gosh. That the first move, you'll know what it is to hide psychologically. The first move after they eat is to hide from themselves, from one another, from God. Um, they've got fig leaves because they, they, th- there's this shame sort of immediately erupts. Um, and so all of a sudden Adam is not safe for Eve and Eve is not safe for Adam and God is not safe for them either. Um, my dear friend Chris Mitchell, who used to work in Tory for a short time and then died suddenly, I love, he used to say, you know what I love about heaven is I'm going to be safe for other people. So just, just very humble and, and really tender. 
But I mean, I take it part of it, the background to that statement is that we are not safe. Um, and as, as awful as that kind of shame was, it wasn't entirely off base. Now that doesn't mean that, that um, bodies and sexuality are, are something of which to be ashamed in and of themselves, but it means that immediately when sin comes in, there's this, this radical compromise over my very ability to just bear myself before another even above myself, even to bear myself before myself, and certainly to bear myself before God. Hiding and shame. Um, second, strife and strain. Immediately. Strife between people. I mean, this is this comical finger pointing. The, the woman you gave me, <laughs> I mean, the serpent, it's ridiculous. Um, the finger pointing and the strife that is set up here immediately. Augustine has got this big, great point where he said, you know, the, the hard thing about the, the minute Eve tasted the fruit, Adam was in a no-win. Now, he's just as sinful, but he's in this no-win where the minute sin enters in, you have to choose, is it God or my wife? Well, that's just a bad choice. You should love God, you should love your wife. But the minute sin comes in, there's a competition of loves that should never have been there. And so there's this strife. And because I'm afraid that I might not be safe from you, I know that you're not safe from me, and so I'm always defending myself from you. Um, there's also strife between humanity and the non-human creation. The serpent, of course, there's the, the mutual heel bruising, but that will come in, come up again and again. Um, the Lord says, I'm not going to take you to the promised land of Israel too quick because those animals are going to eat you if it's too quick. So we need to do it gradually so that the animals don't take over the place and then eat you. That is a post-lapsarian, a post-fall reality. Um, and there's also a strain in fulfilling the divine mandate to be fruitful. That, that's, that's a painful thing. All of the pain that comes in with it. Um, and there's a strain um, in the uh, subduing of the earth, in the toil that comes on. Death. Death shows up. Death enters the scene. And uh, I find this really interesting. The meaning of dust is, is revealed or, or maybe even changed. For you are dust, 319. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Originally, you are dust, like you were made from the dust. Who knows if Adam and Eve, you know, kind of, kind of quite what the state of their mortality or immortality was. It certainly seems that because there was a tree of life there, that they could have been immortal, even if they weren't made immortal. Um, but now we know you're dust, which means, you know, you're, you're of the earth. Um, maybe also that you're... Uh, you have some fragility and vulnerability to you, just like all creatures do. But now you are, you are dust into dust you shall return. Now it's guaranteed. It's not hypothetical that you're vulnerable, but now you are, you are headed to death for all of your life. Even God's merciful provision for them in the wake of their shame is caught up in death. These are, they're clothed in garments of skin. How do you get garments of skin? You kill whatever was in the skin. So death has entered the scene as a consequence of sin and as a mercy. And that, that's how complicated it becomes. And finally, um, there's an irony in the sin because there's the most profound opportunity loss. So the serpent was right. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. This is the thing he held out to Eve. Don't you want to be like God in knowing good and evil? And she's like, yes. And, and it happened. Um, so in the one sense, the very thing they wanted happened, but it that wasn't quite the thing they wanted. Right? Um, Jürgen Moltmann, a German theologian, has this great line in a book of his where he says, it's actually, the, it's actually the Christian hope that the serpent's promise will be realized, but on the divine initiative, that you will be like God's, and not in this sort of, tragic sense, but like in the ultimate sense, but on the divine initiative. And that's the whole problem. It wasn't they wanted something. It's that they wanted something on their terms and without adhering to the word of God. Um, or Ephraim says again, if the serpent had been rejected along with sin, Adam and Eve would have eaten from the tree of life and the tree of knowledge would not have been withheld from them. From the one, they would have gained infallible knowledge. And from the other, they would have received immortal life. They would have acquired divinity with their humanity. And if they had acquired infallible knowledge and immortal life, they would have possessed them in those same bodies. So the, the opportunity loss is, is massive. Okay, that's Genesis 1 to 3.
Now I want to talk to you of just a few more categories. Um, there's so much we could do about theological anthropology um, from the Pentateuch, but I, I want to just pick up a few things. One is, is uh, the distinctions that go into being human. And this is really important. We, we need to make distinctions within humanity. Um, so I'm going to run you through a list of distinctions that are vital. The first distinction to think about in anthropology, according to the Pentateuch, is that between creator and creature. This is really vital. It is by far more significant than any other distinction we can think of. It's God is in heaven, we are not. It's creator and creature. Now the second big distinction is between humans and the non-human creation. Again, this is a huge distinction. Now we've got a lot in common with animals, but we are not animals, or at least not non-human animals. We could have a conversation about what, whether humans are animals of a certain kind, but we are, we are decidedly different by creation and by design. There are interesting conversations to be had about the kind of rationality that, that porpoises, that orcas might have. And there's some really, really interesting conversations about what happens when you, when you get creatures who approach um, at least low levels of human capacities. And those are fascinating. That will never undo the basic distinction between humans and non-human animals. I think from a scriptural standpoint. Um, now, before noting distinctions within humanity, and this, this is sur surprising to me that this needs to be said, but I think it really does these days, we must note the importance of a common human nature rooted biblically in a common descent and our universal participation in the image of God. So those two things, Adam and Eve, everyone, and the universal participation in the, in the image of God. I say it's weird that this needs to be said because when I was in grad school 15, 20 years ago, the thing that we always wanted to keep in mind was that people were particular. Um, there are particularities, um, all sorts of particularities, but you need to pay attention to gender and ethnicity and class, but also just all of what it means to be you. You can't talk about the human in the abstract or you're just bound to be totalitarian and run roughshod over people. And that's so vital. Um, but I think we're actually in a moment where we are so aware of difference and we're aware of difference in such a way that we're liable to say things like, um, you can't understand my experience. I'm a man, you're a woman. And, and then there might be some truth to that. Even. I mean, I think there's probably some truth to the fact that when we are at profound differences, there are going to be ways that we can't fully, fully access. But the acknowledgement of a common human nature that means that that yeah, there actually are ways that I can understand you. I think is, is vital, actually apologetically pretty important these days. So I'm gonna go on with more distinctions, but I think it's important to acknowledge that lack of distinction. Now the primordial human distinction, according to the Pentateuch, is between man and woman. And the first thing to know about man and woman is that they are the same, that they match. Um, again, not, not the same in like, there's no d difference in the world between man and woman, but, but they correspond. Eve is a helpmate suitable, fitting. She fits Adam. Um, all the other animals were not suitable to help. Um, that's vital. And yet, even though they are the same, this is also the most basic differentiation within humanity. And it's, I think that is patent um, in the Pentateuch. Now there's another early distinction in the Pentateuch between the righteous and the unrighteous. It emerges even with Abel and Cain, only one of whom gives a fitting offering to the Lord. Um, and it, the Pentateuch will complicate that in all sorts of ways because sometimes the righteous are wicked and sometimes the wicked, lots of stuff. But this distinction, basic distinction between the righteous and wicked um, is, is a vital one there. God also makes a distinction based on his election, the covenants he makes, and the promises he gives. So when he calls Abraham, um, he distinguishes him from the nations. This is a distinguishing that God makes that is vital to understand what it means to be human, I think the Pentateuch wants to say. And this distinction becomes, becomes embodied, literally marked in the flesh, in the rite of circumcision, which ritually separates God's people from the nations. Now, I've got a really fun little sidebar here um, to talk about the way God's people, Israel, is distinguished from the nations. Um, you can call it Israel or Egypt. That's what, that's what we'll call it for now. 
So here's a bunch of things to know about Israel and Egypt. One, weirdly, both Joseph and Moses are, well, Egyptians. And they're Egyptians at the heart of imperial power. When uh, Moses goes over to Midian and saves the day for Jethro's kids, they're like, this Egyptian. Well, of course he's Egyptian. He grew up in that you know, household. I know he's a sojourner. I know he's, he's uh, uh, an Israelite. But he also grew up in the courts of power. He's fully enculturated into Egypt. Um, Joseph, second in command of Egypt. One thing. Now, two, on the other hand, Exodus 11.7, the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. The Lord makes that distinction, and it's a vital one. Don't be Egypt, Israel. Don't go back to Egypt. Don't, don't be Canaan. You know, be, be Israel. And in fact, to sin is to transgress the distinction the Lord makes between Israel and Egypt and the nations. And, and Israel commits this sin retrospectively when it longs for Egypt. Oh my gosh, Egypt was the best. And prospectively, uh, when, it, when it lives in Canaan. And yet... Almost immediately once the covenant is made, Israel becomes Egypt. This is great. The Lord makes the distinction. You're Israel, you're not Egypt. And yet almost immediately, once the covenant is made, Israel becomes Egypt, committing idolatry by worshiping a graven image and receiving Egyptian-style punishment. Exodus 32. Then the Lord sent a plague. Heard of those? I mean, it was like five minutes ago, there was this like series of plagues. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. And Israel repeatedly longs for the good old days in Egypt. So, Numbers 14, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we had died in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Then they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. This is, this is just nuts. The Lord warns Israel that though he has chosen them to be his covenant people, that does not inoculate them from idolatry. This is Numbers 33. But if you don't drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then those of them whom you let remain shall be as barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land where you dwell. And I will do to you as I thought to do to them. The harem, which is the word for the the total devotion to destruction that God commands of the Canaanites. The harem is put in place as a radical measure. What? To keep Israel from becoming like the Canaanites. That is the whole goal. Don't become like them. And the curses of Deuteronomy have, have Israel as Egypt or Israel as Canaan in mind. Listen to this. Uh, it, just a few passages from 28. Deuteronomy 28. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt. You shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not enjoy its fruit. That's what the Canaanites had. Remember that? Uh, and he will bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt. And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt, a journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. They can't even sell themselves back into the situation from which the Lord delivered them. when they go back to Egypt. Or Deuteronomy 31, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you're about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after the foreign gods among them in the land that they're entering, and they will forsake me and break my covenant that I've made with them. The Old Testament scholar Daniel Block, this is a phrase, you ready? He, he, he says that the theme of the book of Judges, but I want to argue that this is already a foregone conclusion in Deuteronomy, that the theme is the canonization of Israel. Israel goes in the land, and rapidly they become Canaanized. By the time Israel stands on the threshold of the land, it's become apparent that circumcision of the flesh is no guarantee of covenant faithfulness. Some of us have been talking about that. Turns out that even the very marker of what it means to be Israel isn't enough. Despite circumcision, despite the election which it presupposes, despite the exodus and the law, despite the fact that, quote, this commandment that I command you, this is Deuteronomy 30, today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off, but the word is very near you. It's in your mouth, in your heart, so that you can do it. Despite all this, Israel doesn't do it. Why? Because their hearts aren't circumcised. 
their hearts uncircumcised. And so, not all Israel is Israel. And that's one of the, the craziest things. Not all Israel is Israel. That is, not all those who've been circumcised are circumcised. As Paul will say, Romans 9, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. That's already there in Deuteronomy. So there's already this fundamental distinction even within Israel. Not all Israel are Israel. To belong to Israel is to belong to God's covenant people, to keep covenant with God. And only those who are circumcised of heart can do that. Fleshly circumcision just isn't enough. If the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 calls Israel to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, Israel will do so only when God restores her fortunes and regathers her from exile. And the Lord, this is Deuteronomy 30 again, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Um, so the final distinction here is, is uh, within the very people of God. It's between those who are circumcised in heart and those who are not circumcised in heart. That might be, I don't know if I want to call it the most important distinction in humanity for the Benedict, but it's certainly up there those whose hearts are circumcised and those whose hearts aren't. Okay, three last things and I'll let you out of here. Three features, and again, we could have like 10 of these, but three quick features of what it means to be human east of Eden. Features. One, we are prone to wander. The Pentateuch has a consistently pessimistic anthropology. Uh, twice in Deuteronomy 9, it says, you turned aside quickly. That's the word, quickly. It's a description of Israel's apostasy with the golden calf. Almost immediately as soon as God had made a covenant with them. Uh, also, almost immediately upon entrance into the land. It's already predicted. This also seems to have been the case with Adam and Eve. Now, no one quite knows how quickly they fell, but there's little narrative space given to that time. Adam and Eve, you turned aside quickly. Not eventually, but quickly. Already in Noah's days, quote, <laughs> The wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intention of the thoughts of his hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. The earth was corrupt. This is all Genesis 6. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and the earth was filled with violence and all flesh had corrupted their, their way on the earth. And so, the Lord says, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. So first, like early on, it's a mess. Um, second, as goes Adam, as goes the human, so goes the world. That's a, that's a vital thing too. As goes the human, so goes the world. Um, also, um, God decides to start over with Noah. That's, that's a sign of how bad it was. He, uh, the... With Noah, with the covenant of Noah, you get the first animal sacrifices so that they're not vegetarians anymore, but uh, they can't eat flesh with its life that is its blood in it. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. That is merciful and pitiful at once, that judgment. Because the Lord is saying, look, all of them, their intentions are evil from the youth. So what's it going to do if I, if I start over again and again and again and again and again? So it's a mercy, but it's pitiful. Um, the overwhelming supply of animals needed for sacrifices itself suggests something of the work of atoning continually for Israel, of what it takes for God to dwell amongst this people. So Numbers 28 and 29 describes the daily, the Sabbath, the monthly, and the annual festal offerings. The amount of animals just just to make it possible for God to dwell with these people. It says something about the spread and the depth of sin. Um, again, sort of God nearly starts over, even after we does start over with Noah, he almost starts over with Moses. Moses has to talk him down. And it just keeps on keeping on Deuteronomy 9. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place at the cusp of the land 40 years later, you've been rebellious against the Lord. From the day, this is just who you are. Now, early on, God does deal with individual righteous people. There's Noah, Abram, and Lot, uh, these righteous who are found amongst the wicked. But the Pentateuch goes out of its way to display the flaws of even the righteous, 
So you get Noah's drunkenness, his exposed nakedness. You get Abraham and Isaac's attempts to pass their wives off as their sisters. You get Jacob's trickery and deceit. You get Moses' hot-headed anger uh, and his reluctance to follow God's call. Now, none of this establishes a fully developed doctrine of original sin in the Pentateuch. Um, I just don't think it's there. Um, and note that children actually seem to have no knowledge of good or evil. That's Deuteronomy 1. And possibly thereby to be as yet unstained by sin. Um, but already in the Pentateuch, we sure do have the ubiquity of sin. It's everywhere. Um, the depth of sin and the universality of sin. No one doesn't sin. And even the good guys are bad guys. That is, that is what the Pentateuch is saying. Two. Humanity is marked by mercy. So we're prone to wander, but we're also marked by mercy. So Adam and Eve are barred from the tree of life in the garden so they won't live forever under the weight of calamity. I think that's a profound mercy, that we won't have to live forever in this condition. The garments of skin to clothe Adam and Eve. Again, this, God, God is like, where are you? And here they are, shamed and hiding. Instead, you know, he could just... I mean, he does do a little bit of this, but he also says, here, let, let, let me clothe you. Here you are in your shame. Let, let me cover your shame for you. How are we even talking about shame, but let me cover it for you. Cain, fat fratricide. Fratricide shows up again and again. Um, Cain kills his brother, and he knows he's going to get it from someone. God gives him a mark to protect him. Even in the midst of his wandering and his exile, he has this protective mark, the mark of Cain. Our shortened lifespan, 930 years for Adam, shortened 120 years, partly in mercy and partly, I think, in divine exasperation. Uh, God says, my spirit shall not abide in, my, in man forever, for he is flesh. His flesh shall be 120 years. Also, the sacrificial system, at least some of it. We, we have this whole system that, it, that is merciful towards us and is structured such that God can live uh, with us and we can live with him. But in such a way that we won't be sort of burned up by the divine holy fire. Laws. This struck me uh, reading through the Pentateuch this time. Laws that are ordered to anticipated injustice and unfaithfulness. This is, these laws are not a blueprint for an ideal society for a utopia. They're a blueprint for a society everywhere marked by sin to restrain sin and its worst consequences. Put, putting it on a leash rather than stopping it in its track. This doesn't stop sin, but it does put it on a leash. So Amy and I, hi Amy. Amy and I were talking about um, one of the laws in Deut Deuteronomy 22 for about rape. And it's like, so, so he said, this is a fantastic example, Amy. It was really helpful for me. Um, so a woman is raped in a field by a man where no one can hear her cry. And God says, so that man has to pay for her, pay for her to, to pay to be married to her, and he has to marry her, and he's stuck with her, and he can't divorce her. And Amy's like, I hate this. No, I know it's God's word. So, you know, she also did the obligatory, I know it's God's word. But, <laughs> but here's, the, here's the great thing as we were str struggling and talking this through. Of course you hate this. Of course you hate A, rape, and B, that a woman would be sort of stuck with her rapist. But consider the, in, in small societies, the shame and the vulnerability and the economic calamity that a woman who's been raped is subject to who is almost assuredly unmarriable, possibly in an economic dire straits. Um, and what God says is, now you are economically provided for. Now, it's not great to be with your rapist. Like, this, is, this is not sort of a, a match made in heaven. But she's economically provided for. And that is a much bigger deal than you feel okay about your partner. And for the rapist, um, it might make a guy think twice if he thinks, if I rape a woman, this is not like a, hey, I can just sort of do my thing and then, you know, say thank you, goodbye. No, you're stuck with her and you can't divorce her and you're on the hook financially and people are going to know about it. Now, again, this doesn't stop rape, but it does mitigate some of the worst consequences. And I think we see that in the law again and again and again. God says, I know how jacked up you guys are, but I'm going to put things in place that, that mitigate, that that." lessen some of the worst consequences and, and try to keep sin on its leash somewhat. The provision of cities of refuge for those who accidentally kill others. What, what a mercy. 
Um, now, people who did it on purpose, you're just kind of screwed. And the Avenger can find you. But, but if you did it on accident, you ran into someone, you, you were driving along, you didn't mean to do it, someone crossed when they shouldn't have crossed, and you ran over them. And there's the horror of that. But there's also people who want to get, get even with you. There's a place you can go where you'll be protected until their anger has been cooled. Um, a law that is attendant to sojourners and widows and orphans, the vulnerable, and Israel being continually reminded of their need to care for them. And lastly, and this is where I'll, where I'll stop, our third point, and this is also a mercy, the provision of mediators. Um, and I think, I think partly this belongs in anthropology because I think part of what Benedict is telling us is that humans, at least humans east of Eden, need mediators. We need mediating presences. So you get... Abraham, um, I love this passage where he's sort of haggling with God about Sodom. What if there are 50 righteous people? Okay, okay I mean, all due respects, 40, 30? You know, it's going to further and further. Now, God doesn't end up having to change any plans because there are so few righteous people that he can still torch Sodom. And, but do you notice the way that God invites the one who's given dominion over the earth into um, let me put it this way, what at least appears to be a sort of negotiation about the fate of a city, and in such a way that the human partner is asking for mercy. You see that again and again in the mediators, is that the mediators are the one who are pleading to God for mercy. Um, Moses, again and again throughout Numbers, he's a mediator in the face of divine anger convincing God again and again. I don't, it's, I don't know how I feel about the language of convincing God, but that's sure how it reads in the narrative. God, don't do it. At one point, 40 days and 40 nights, he's lying, he's fasting and praying. God, don't do it. Don't destroy them. Similarly, priests. Oh, actually, I want to read that to you. And I really am almost done, guys, don't worry. Um, Deuteronomy 9, 25 to 29. It's beautiful. This is right after the golden calf, Moses. So I lay prostrate before the Lord for these 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord had said he would destroy you. And I prayed to the Lord, oh Lord God, do not destroy your people and your heritage whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with your mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Don't regard the stubbornness of this people or their wickedness or their sin. Lest the land from which you brought us say, because the Lord wasn't able to bring them into the land that he promised them. And because he hated them, he's brought them out to put them to death in the wilderness. For they are your people and your heritage whom you brought out by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Again and again, these human mediators pleading for God's mercy. Priests as mediators bear the names, this is Exodus 28, they bear the names of God's people before the Lord for remembrance. They carry the names, the presences of these people before the Lord. Um, mediators always seem to move God from anger to mercy. And they, they never, this is really interesting, they never convince God to vent his wrath in the Pentateuch, but only ever to, to show his mercy or, or, um, or sometimes to do what he was going to do, as in the case of Abraham and Sodom. Um, this is interesting. So one more time with good old Amy, because we're in Opsars. Amy said, well, this because, it's because they're, they're sympathetic. Because they understand the situation. And I think that's right. Um, that part of the role of a mediator is to sympathize with people and their weakness. And that's part of what a human mediator can do. Now, it's a little troubling um, because it sounds like a mediator has to convince God to be merciful. And yet, um, and it even looks to me like Moses is more merciful than God. Um, we know God's merciful. He dwells above the mercy seat. That's actually where he lives. Uh, Psalm 80 says he's enthroned upon the cherubim. Um, and, and he expands. So in Exodus 3, he gives us his name and describes himself. Exodus 34, he expands on it. And there we hear, uh, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, etc. He doesn't always seem slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, merciful 
and gracious. We know he is, but there's something in the narrative that's difficult. I think there's an unresolved tension uh, for us. Um, and I think, well, I, I think much of it, Deuteronomy 18, uh, Moses says, there's going to be a prophet like me who comes along. Um, and then go with me to the very end of Deuteronomy. This is where we'll end. He says, talking about Joshua, and I think as you read, you're thinking, finally, we got the prophet like Moses. Joshua is awesome. Um, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses has laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses. It's, I think we should be very surprised by that. Um, and this is, Whoever wrote this last bit of the Pentateuch is writing way back, or sorry, like, sorry, is writing way late in Israel's history. Because um, he is reflecting on the whole prophetic tradition. He knows that there's been a lot of prophets. There has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all his servants and all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So just to, to, to conclude with, I think, an abiding tension, um, here's what we got. We know God's merciful, but he seems, as at least as a character of the Pentateuch, prone to wrath, not slow to wrath. We know that he acts mercifully when a human mediator intercedes and calls him to mercy. And we also know that we haven't had a mediator like Moses since Moses died. I think, I think we're left with that kind of pregnant pause at the end of the Pentateuch. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.